If it were not for the existence of a single letter addressed to Christians in Corinth, no one would have ever known that Clement of Rome existed. And perhaps he didn't. This anonymously authored letter, known as First Clement, is styled after the Pauline epistles. And like most of the New Testament writings, just exactly who the author was, or just exactly when it was written, is a matter of debate. Most scholars believe that this letter is the earliest example of Christian literature outside of the New Testament. But I don't believe this is true. We don't know exactly when First Clement was written, but I do know with some certainty when it wasn't written, and that is any time within the first century. The author clearly shows an awareness of Paul's writings and makes a clear reference to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Take up the epistle of the blessed Paul the Apostle. What wrote he first unto you in the beginning of the gospel? If we take the standard dates for Paul, this means 1 Clement had to be written after the mid-50s of the first century. The author also seems familiar with Acts of the Apostles, which is easily a second century work, since he makes what seems to be a reference to Acts 14.19, which claims that Paul had been stoned in the city of Lustra. That would be stoned with rocks. He also mentions Paul preaching the gospel in front of earthly rulers, which of course also comes from the fiction of Acts, since Paul is depicted as speaking boldly to King Herod Agrippa, as well as Gallio, Felix, and Festus. But another reason to believe 1 Clement was not written in the first century is that the author makes references to an established church hierarchy of bishops and deacons and presbyters and appears to have no expectation of Jesus' imminent return, an expectation that began to wane early in the second century. But there is still another reason why First Clement is easily a mid-second century work and it relates to the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. But let's look at Titus as an example. Titus was once thought to be authored by Paul, but we now know better. It is one of many forgeries in the New Testament written in the name of Paul. Some facts that bear upon the dating of 1 Clement is the dating of Titus, Titus was not part of Marcion's canon of ten epistles, which included many of Paul's writings. Marcion's canon was assembled roughly around the year 140. One must assume that if Titus was written shortly after Paul's death, it would have floated around for 70 years without Marcion getting wind of it. Not very likely. Prior to Irenaeus's quotes from Titus around the year 170, there are no certain quotes to be found. But there is a clear reference to Titus in an apocryphal work, our very own Clement of Rome's one and only epistle to the Corinthians. In the second chapter, he uses very similar language to Titus chapter 3, verse 1. He speaks about submission now, this alone would be a fairly weak argument, but a few verses later, we can see that Clement does indeed have Titus 3.1 in mind as he's pinning his second chapter. The phrase, ready to every good work, leaves no doubt that Clement knew about the epistle we call Titus, and naturally, Clement would have thought of this epistle as Paul's. Titus must have been written between 130 and 160 CE, late enough for Marcion to not know of it in 140, but early enough for Irenaeus to know of it in 170. This easily puts the date of composition for First Clement well into the second century. But we can't push the letter too far into the second century because Irenaeus mentions it near the end of the second century sometime around 170 CE. The earliest manuscript containing the letter is a partial copy in Coptic from the 4th century. The only complete copy dates from the 11th century and was not known by scholars until the 19th century 
when it was discovered within the Codex Hierosolimitanus. The epistle was apparently very well received among Christians and church fathers. Yet, even though First Clement enjoyed almost universal favor and did become canon in some localized regions, it did not become part of the universal canon. It may be that the letter offered nothing more than what Paul had already said before. Maybe it contained too much recapitulation of Old Testament stories. It may have been that its supposed author did not figure prominently enough in any of the existing Christian literature. Perhaps the church fathers couldn't link their supposed Clement strongly enough to Paul or any of the other disciples or apostles. Maybe the epistle was just a little too lengthy. It contains approximately 14,000 words, a good 4,500 words longer than Paul's longest epistle, the epistle to the Romans. It may have been that the author spends a little too much time discussing how Gentile myths of resurrecting birds prove the general resurrection of the dead. Or perhaps his references to apocryphal writings cost him a few points among the Orthodox fathers. Or maybe it was all of the above. Whether written in the first century or not, and whether a Clement of Rome wrote the letter, or a Bubba of Rome, is inconsequential to the beliefs revealed therein. So let's go ahead and call him Clement. In Clement's letter to the Corinthians, he makes an argument for a resurrection of the dead at Jesus' return. It is important to realize that Clement is making a case for a future resurrection of Christians, and not necessarily for Jesus' resurrection. But I think it's important to see just what kind of argument Clement finds convincing regarding the idea of a general resurrection of the dead. This should shed light on the mindset of those who also believed, as Clement did, that Jesus had risen from the dead. Keep in mind that the claims I'm about to read were not thought by Clement to be a myth, but fact. Let us consider that wonderful sign which takes place in eastern lands, that is, in Arabia, and the countries round about. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix. This is the only one of its kind and lives 500 years. And when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest of frankincense and myrrh and other spices into which, when the time is fulfilled, it enters and dies. I hate to interrupt here, but the spices, frankincense and myrrh, in that order, remind me of a particular Bible verse. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Could this be a clever pointer toward the myth of the phoenix? a link by the interpolator of the birth narrative in Matthew showing that Jesus also, laying in his nest, so to speak, would rise again? But let's continue. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced. I, you know, I hate to interrupt again, but a worm is not produced by decaying flesh. Maggots, for example, come from flies that lay eggs in the dead flesh. Muscle tissue does not turn into worms. But let's continue which being nourished by the juices of the dead bird, brings forth feathers. Feathers? A worm grows feathers. Crocoduck eats your heart out. Then when it has acquired strength, it takes up that nest in which are the bones of its parent, and bearing these it passes from the land of Arabia into Egypt, to the city called Heliopolis. And in open day, flying in the sight of all men, it places them on the altar of the sun, and having done this, hastens back to its former abode. Wait a minute, in the sight of all men? So this event should have occurred at least three more times since Clement wrote this, but I don't recall any mass sightings of a flying worm carrying a bird's nest and depositing it on any altar in Egypt. But let's continue. The priests then inspect the registers of the dates and find that it has returned exactly 
as the 500th year was completed. My skeptometer is flashing. In 500 years, entire races of people could be displaced, religions appearing and vanishing again. And if this has occurred every 500 years, where is this register? And where is the evidence for this worm's appearance in the last 500 years? Now let's hear how Clement ties this myth into the idea of human resurrection. 